Welcome to the second episode of the Atlas for Wellness podcast. My name is Chad McIntyre, and I'm a doctor at the Triad Upper Cervical Clinic in Kernersville, North Carolina. For those of you who are sick and tired of being sick and tired, for those of you who are simply seeking the best way to be as healthy as possible, or even for those just curious about new ideas and philosophies, this may well be the podcast you've been looking for. For what it's worth, I grew sick and tired of being sick and tired when I was 23 years old. After 10 years of suffering from a variety of health issues, I assumed that I'd probably already felt the best I was ever going to feel. But then a series of not really random but seemingly so events took place that landed me in the office of an upper cervical doctor. What's that? It's a specialty that focuses on monitoring and correcting alignment issues in the upper neck that affect your body's ability to function normally and to maintain its structural balance. You see, injuries occur at various times in our lives that affect the delicate relationship between our head and our neck, often causing our brainstem to be compromised. Your brainstem is what regulates blood pressure, pain, digestion, balance, and equilibrium, among other things. So to regain or maintain health, it's very important that the brain stem be working the right way. An upper cervical doctor's job is to make sure that it is. I consider myself fortunate to have found out about upper cervical care when I did. Since I've become an upper cervical doctor myself, I've met a lot of people who suffered for a lot longer than I did. That said, upper cervical care is still the best kept secret in healthcare. In episode one of the podcast, we talked about the importance of stress management. Today, we're going to zero in on upper cervical care. If you read my blog, Atlas for Wellness at blogspot.com, you will note that my feelings about upper cervical care's place in the healthcare lexicon center on its fundamental foundational nature. It's like eating well. Personally, I don't need a randomly controlled clinical research trial to tell me that eating well is the right or the smart thing to do. That's, that's not a theory, like germs are really bad and we should never be exposed to them, or genetics are fixed and finite and we therefore have to be afraid of what our 200 years deceased ancestors died from. Eating well, that's the law of life. You put good things in, your body builds good things like new cells accordingly. Upper cervical care follows the law of life as well. The body is designed to work a certain way and we need to make sure that the system put in place to ensure that it works that way is operating at peak efficiency. It's also a no-brainer that the body's structural integrity, like any structure's integrity, is largely predicated on foundational balance and strength. So the upper neck's alignment given that the upper neck is the body's foundation, it's body's built from the top down, it has to be balanced to expect physical well-being. Bottom line, end of story. That said, research is an important cog in the wheel of societal acceptance whenever it comes to health-related matters. And like it or not, chiropractic as a profession and a prominent member of the healing arts has been under the microscope since the the American Medical Association began publicly condemning it decades ago. Something, by the way, that the AMA was sued for and got its rear end handed to it in court back in the 1980s because of. Research is a must. So that's what I want to talk about today. Research and upper cervical care. Some of what I'm about to discuss will be specific to what doctors in my profession are doing in the research world, while others will target research that gives credence to the basic tenet that the body functioning normally, in this case specifically speaking about neurologic function, dramatically enhances the body's ability to maintain and sustain itself, borrowing off the age-old concept, which is really a fact, that the body can heal itself. Let's begin with perhaps the most common condition that patients at my office seek us out to address, headaches and migraines. 20 years ago, groundbreaking research conducted at the National Headache Research Foundation in Chicago concluded that new imaging techniques had identified a malfunctioning brainstem as a root cause of headaches of all types, migraines included. Given that the brainstem rests in the delicate door hole space at the bottom of the skull 
and the ring-like spaces of the top two bones of the neck. It made a lot of sense to doctors who study anatomy and physiology that the brainstem being adversely affected would cause headaches. When the brainstem malfunctions, the blood vessels that surround the brain begin to swell, resulting in the nerve fibers attached to the vessels becoming overexcited. Hyperexcitation of the nerves may cause pain and or sensitivity to light and sound. A chain reaction then occurs that may have a wide-ranging effect on the body as the increased activity of the nervous system causes the heart rate to increase and abnormal breathing as well as the slowing down of the digestive processes which contribute to nausea and vomiting. It's a vicious cycle. One of the most frustrating things about medical research is that unfortunately even brilliant discoveries are followed up often with the wrong questions. In this case, it was great. A malfunctioning brainstem is common to all these patients with headaches. So what drugs can we make that will slow down the overexcited brainstem? Now bear in mind that the brainstem is the hub of your entire nervous system, regulating all the internal communication between your brain and your organs. Predictably, any attempts to chemically alter brainstem function had severe side effects, and the project was, as of 2016, abandoned. The original conclusion is still valid, though. The brainstem being compromised is going to cause a cascade of effects inside the body. Since it's what controls the body's ability to function normally and produce normal circumstances, then it functioning abnormally predisposes the production of abnormal circumstances, headaches and migraines among them. Next up is immune system dysfunction, which can manifest in a variety of ways, including a greater tendency to quote-unquote catch the popular infection, or more aggressively as an autoimmune disorder that sees the body's own defense system turn against it. The immune system like our cardiovascular system that allows for blood to get to all parts of the body, and our nervous system that transmits electrical impulses, power to be straightforward, to all parts of the body, spreads far and wide across the body. It is controlled by the thymus gland, which is in constant communication with the brain. That communication is regulated by the brainstem. For reasons unknown to me, It's a relatively recent confirmation through research that the immune system and nervous systems are intricately linked. Basic anatomy and physiology would laugh at that needing to be verified by research, but that's nevertheless still the case. Immune response is dictated by nervous system response. The function of the complex electrical network of the human body is therefore imperative to immunity. To stay well, the nervous system has to be strong, and in order for the nervous system to be strong, the brainstem has to work properly. In order for the brainstem to work properly, nothing like a simple misalignment in the upper neck to the point that the brainstem becomes compromised can be in play. Traditional methods to autoimmune disorders are being proven silly. One method sees the immune system depressed by powerful drugs, making the entire body more susceptible to infection and the accumulation of abnormal cells, otherwise known as cancer, that in large part are kept in check by healthy immune response. Others see powerful steroids attempt to boost immune function, but as scientists at Oregon State are making known, that approach is like hitting an ant with a sledgehammer. Pulling a little harder on that narrative thread, let's talk about one of the most common and most destructive autoimmune disorders, multiple sclerosis. The upper cervical world doesn't typically look to conduct research studies about specific medical diagnoses because it would arguably be unethical to create a control group of people whose brain stems have been verified through CT scan, x-ray, thermographic, or structural analysis to be compromised by an upper cervical misalignment and are thus left in need of correction. Restoration of normal neurologic integrity, structural stability, blood and cerebrospinal fluid flow does not produce a theoretical benefit, but an obviously factual one. That said, MS has been an exception, and the relationships that upper cervical care has as a profession has established with the Italian Medical Association has produced inspired clinical data. It was the president of the IMA, I suppose it's called, that stood up after learning all about upper cervical and said, 
we want to help you prove that which is already obvious, that making this correction in the upper neck can restore health. MS has been one of the target conditions from that group. Last year, results were released from a multi-year clinical trial that sought to identify a byproduct of the upper cervical misalignment called chronic cerebrospinal venous insufficiency, a fancy way of saying that the cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, is being disrupted. They were basically looking to ascertain that that particular issue, chronic cerebrospinal venous insufficiency, was a common root cause of multiple sclerosis. The conclusion? Expand the trial and keep at it because we're on to something big. These doctors believe that the upper cervical correction should become a hallmark of each and every MS patient, the thought process being that the restoration of CSF flow and the drainage of areas of CSF accumulation could be a key to ceasing the progression of MS. And I'll personally go a little further and suggest that if the upper cervical correction could be made before the condition had developed, then we'd be on our way to helping prevent MS and other such autoimmune and common health disorders too. Next up is the relationship between upper cervical misalignments, which we refer to as a brainstem subluxation, a.k.a. a misalignment of one of the top two bones of the neck, to the point that abnormal tension on the brainstem and its surrounding tissues interferes with normal neurologic function, the relationship between that condition and various so-termed mental disorders. I'm not a doctor particularly keen on labels, A seven-year-old, for instance, who can't concentrate and wants to play all the time while in school could just be exhibiting symptoms of being seven years old. Having said that, upper cervical care has been well known to help people address abnormal mental states by, here's that common theme again, restoring neurologic integrity and proper fluid flow to the brain. Proper blood flow is partially what allows for the brain's various lobes to control actions like emotional response learning retention, comprehension, and focus. For this reason, Dr. B.J. Palmer used to take a team of upper cervical chiropractors to mental hospitals near Davenport, Iowa, to adjust the patients, leading doctors on staff to comment that a lot of them were capable of being released afterwards. The body that functions normally can achieve quite a bit, plain and simple. Following Dr. Palmer's example, a study was conducted on patients suffering from clinical depression. A test was given to these patients before and after upper cervical corrections. The after tests showed significant improvement across the board. The sample size was fairly small, but 75% of the patients dramatically improved their emotional response. One interesting thing to note about studies like these is that unless they're backed by an entity like the Italian Medical Association or a hospital with a large research budget, A lot of these initial pilot studies see great results but don't go much further, and the reason is money. Billions are funneled into medical research by pharmaceutical companies, not a conspiracy theory, but a fact. Billions are funneled into cancer research. Where's the results? More people have cancer today than ever, while all these billions have been spent on research in the last 30 years. To that I say, come on, man. We'll finish up today by talking about perhaps the best known research directly attributed to upper cervical care versus a particular condition. In this case, hypertension, otherwise known as high blood pressure. It's very common. In tandem with the University of Chicago Medical School, an upper cervical practitioner's pilot study confirmed the following paraphrased from the research report. The brainstem subluxation is associated with decreased brainstem function, and increased blood pressure. Correction of this misalignment has been associated with reduced blood pressure. This was a pilot study to examine the effects of a non-invasive therapy, upper cervical chiropractic, on long-term changes in blood pressure and heart rate. The design used a randomized, double-blind study with a placebo control group. Patients were computer-randomized and washed out of their current medications for several weeks. The sham placebo intervention was indistinguishable to the patients as this upper cervical procedure, NUCA in this case, is extremely delicate and gentle. We conclude that restoration of foundational head and neck balance is associated with marked 
and sustained reductions in blood pressure similar to the use of two drug therapy. The study findings showed that a sustained blood pressure reduction can be achieved with a procedure to correct the Atlas C1 vertebra misalignment. This correction achieved results similar to giving two different antihypertensive medications. Reductions of blood pressure in the control group, placebo, were minor, about two points, whereas those in the treatment group, the Atlas correction, were significant, 17 points. On average, the before BP of the treatment group was 147 over 92.5, and after the Atlas adjustment was 129.8 over 82.2. There were no adverse effects to reports during this short-term study. A larger study has been underway for several years, and this particular pilot study was featured on Good Morning America. It was in honor of Upper Cervical Awareness Month in the Triad area of North Carolina that I wanted to focus more specifically on upper cervical care and the research going on that supports its basic tenets. For more information about my office, please visit triaduppercervical.com. To access information about offices around the globe, visit uppercervicalcare.com or upcspine.com. UPCSpine.com will also keep you informed of research projects, as will the website for the Upper Cervical Research Foundation, UCRF.org. Remember, if you want to be well, you literally need the Atlas. This has been the Atlas for Wellness podcast. Until next time, thank you for listening.